afternoon, everybody. Thank Hi, you everyone. so much for joining us. Um, we're going to get started right away. I think we have a very um, interesting evening ahead of us. Um, David Butto is a freelance photojournalist whose projects and assignments have taken him to over two dozen countries around the world. He has covered social issues and news events, including post 9-11 in New York, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the death of Pope John Paul II, the 2008 earthquake in China, the funeral of Nelson Mandela, and the Hong Kong protests of 2019, just to name a few. His work has appeared in books and magazines worldwide, including US News and World Report, National Geographic, Time, Geo, Stern, Vogue, Italia, The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, and Paris Match. In 2017, David moved from the San Francisco Bay Area to Washington, D.C. to document what he knew would be a chaotic time in United States politics. David's new book, Brink, chronicles the dynamics of the 2016 presidential election and those dynamics that led finally to the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol in January 2021. While I expected the incompetence, I underestimated the treachery, David writes in his end notes in the book. One year ago today, the transfer of the presidency was successfully completed with the inauguration of Joe Biden. Tonight, we are pleased to have you join us for a conversation with David Buteau, led by Steve. Buteau. Led by Steve Appleford, a Los Angeles-based journalist and contributing writer to the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Rolling Stone, and many other publications. He has interviewed many notable photographers before this evening, including James Natchway, Mary Ellen Mark, and Richard Avedon. You may submit questions, and if we have time at the end of, of their discussion, we'll read those that we can. And with that, I think we should welcome David Buteau and Steve Appleford, and they'll take over from here. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Sid and Michelle. Uh, it's really uh, great to see you here today. Thank you so much for hosting this event and for everyone uh, joining in. Um, it gives us a chance to talk about the background of the, my new book, Brink, and uh, some of the ideas and experiences that, that went into putting it together. Um, so again, thanks everybody. And uh, Steve? Great, I uh, just wanna mention one thing. I'm not a contributor to the Washington Post, but everything else was uh, right on. Um, I think I may have had a couple of things republished there. Um, anyway, so um, why don't we start by uh, talking about the title of the book and where that came from and what, what we were trying to express with that title. Yeah, I think that the, the title Brink, uh, to me, it, it describes um, uh, some specific ideas of this period in history where I, um, I felt like the, the strains on democracy and on the process of government were right to the edge, right to the breaking point or to the brink of, of functioning or of dis dysfunction. So, um, you know, it's uh, initially I thought that there you know, might sort of be a, an aberration this period, but now I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's not so much a, of an aberration. And I think that it's not like this brink is, is now over. I think we're still very close to that. It was an aberration that is open-ended. Yeah, it's an aberration that's open-ended to, yeah, to be determined, right? right. Yeah. So this, uh, this, this project basically started in 2016? It started in 2016, right, shortly before the, the election. And what was the inspiration behind what you were doing? You know, I was I was very surprised that uh, that Donald Trump had gotten the kind of support that he had. And um, a few weeks before the election, I mean, I was expecting that Hillary Clinton was going to win, 
but uh, I was just curious about what the dynamic was with the people, with his supporters, particularly like in the upper Midwest swing states. And so I traveled to Michigan and Ohio and Indiana, and that part of the country that's usually like this pivot point in national elections. And I went to the Trump rallies and I went to uh, Clinton rallies, which sometimes she was there, sometimes it was Bill and Joe Biden was at some of them. Um, just to sort of try to uh, try to capture um, this uh, this mood, something about this time, you know, in America, where you'd have this guy that had no political background was suddenly running for president against somebody who might have been the most experienced candidate ever to run for president. So um, I spent time doing like the political stuff, and then I just did a lot of driving around to find um, to look for other scenes, which to me somehow spoke. To the, to, the, to the region and to, the, uh, uh, to this climate, this time. And that, you know, that meant that I ended up in a lot of just, you know, hanging out with just sort of ordinary people in addition to the, the directly political stuff. But at that time, I had no idea that this was gonna be a book. Right. Um, is there, a, you know, obviously politicians are like entertainers and that they have a surface message that they're trying to project. Is, there, is it difficult to get beneath that surface to get something more revealing? Yeah, I think it's very difficult. Um, I mean, I think one thing about, uh, about Trump is that he, you know, he spent his whole life, you know, his whole professional life anyway, um, on camera and talking about what he wants to talk about. So there's a certain, uh, there's a certain mode that he goes into to do that. And it's, you know, there's a, there's a bluster aspect up, up to it, but he, he uh, speaks in a very direct kind of way to people. I think in that sense, I think he's a very good communicator. Um, so I think people have almost a sense of his personality or what they perceive to be his personality based on him speak, talking on television or talking in front of a crowd. Uh, with Hillary Clinton, I think there's something about the way she interacts with people, particularly like in a, on TV or in a large venue that seems more, a little bit more opaque. So, you know, looking for, um, looking for images or, or some kind of a, a way of, of cutting through some of that is, is always challenging, just like it is with, with all, almost all political situations because of the, the sort of stage managed quality to, to politicians when they're at the high level like that. Right, and so, uh... Is it a matter of waiting for those moments to emerge or are you just really drilling down on trying to get something specific? How does, it, how does that work typically? I, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's rare that I can come up with a specific idea um, before I get to the scene. And so, you know, I, I try to go in really with an open mind. And, uh, you know, if there's a rally, there's sometimes the, 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 the politician at the rally is, is just, for whatever reason, the way things are set up, maybe it's the lighting or the distance that I am, I'm just not gonna get a good picture of that person in that moment. So then in that case, I might turn my attention to the crowd or I'll think about shooting a little bit, shooting a little bit looser so that um, there's some kind of atmosphere that comes through. But it's really more a matter of being uh, observational when I'm, when I'm in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so this period had a lot of things going on. It had Black Lives Matter, it had the, Proud Boys, it had Antifa, it had elections, et cetera. When did this all seem to be one story? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, um, I think that didn't happen until 2020. I mean, I think prior to that, you had Trump's election and then you had this, uh, you know, long period, it was about three years, uh, where there, there was this sort of battle of, um, battle of wills and battle of ideas and battle of investigations playing out in Congress. So it played out, you know, in the halls of power in Congress at the White House and in the media, and then in just sort of the, the interaction between the politicians. But in 2020, that really all changed and everything went, became very physical and very visceral and it played out onto the streets. Um, so, uh, you know, you uh, were able to shoot Donald Trump up close several times, including in the Oval Office. Was he, and I know he likes photographers, 
even likes photographers from publications he hates. That's true. Uh, That's right. So what was your impression with him as a subject, being up close with him? Was it similar to what we see on television or something else? I think, um, I think when the media pack is around him, I think it's basically what you see on television. Um, except maybe for those off moments. I mean, he's not, as soon as the you know, t television camera is on him, he Im immediately goes into this kind of um, uh, almost a persona where he's just, he's projecting out, he's speaking loudly. He's, he has a sort of a forceful expression on his face. You know, he gestures a lot. He has all this down. I mean, he was doing this, you know, decades before he, he ran for president. Um, I think in the in the little bit more off moments, maybe when the cameras are turned off or right before an event, um, and there were a couple of occasions when I was the only media photographer in the Oval Office, and it was just a handful of people in there. Um, the whole the atmosphere was was uh, it didn't have any of that bluster about it or any of that same sort of manic energy. It was very down tempo, and um, sort of friendly actually. Yeah. Uh, at the very beginning of the book there are two pictures uh, of fireworks going off. One of them with uh, some Trump supporters on the ground with flags and Trump uh, gear on. And then another one with a line of police underneath the fireworks. It seems to be a foreshadowing of what comes later. Right, exactly. So those, those pictures were taken um, in, on the 4th of July in 2020. So this was really right in the middle of COVID. Um, it was right in the middle of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And um, so the book is mostly chronological, but in a few examples, and that's, that's one of the notable ones, I've sort of moved things around. So I, I open up the book with those two photographs uh, because to me, they sort of set up this, um, yeah, the foreshadowing, this, this conflict that's gonna happen. And in a way I see the Trump supporters you know, as being, you know, sort of the, um, let's just say the, uh, the rebels in this case pushing against the establishment and the police are kind of holding a line against, uh, against the, or, or the police represent institutions and they're holding the line against the challenge to those institutions. Uh, the first section of the book is basically about people at ground level. It's about, it's just about Americana. It's about campaign supporters, just regular people who happen to be fanatical about a candidate. Uh, why was that an important thing to include? You know, I think it sort of sets up the whole, um, the whole saga in a way, because, you know, Trump didn't become president and the, the kind of energy that he generated from his supporters when he was president, um, I mean, it didn't happen in a vacuum and it was, um, uh, you know, it was sort of deliberately um, uh, cultivated, I think, over several years, you know, in part by Trump himself, uh, but also by media people who supported him. And so, you know, I think those pictures, you know, as a photographer, it's like I'm not trying to tell you to tell the viewer something very specific about people like that, but I'm trying to give an idea of what kind of experience they might have processing Trump so that, you know, there's a picture in the beginning of, of a guy in a, in a motel, the same motel that we mentioned, um, and he's seeing Trump on television. So the idea is that's how he's seeing Trump is this, you know, is this sort of um, a, a media figure, right? And that's how his, his popularity, I think, was developed, not just as a politician, but really prior to that, as sort of this boisterous real estate guy who wants to put his name on everything, and then as a reality, TV um, host or whatever star. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the pictures in the beginning is of a couple, uh, I guess, in a, in a motel room uh, mm -hmm. bed in Michigan. Yeah, it's in Benton Harbor. Mm -hmm. And wh wh what's going on in that picture? Yeah, so this is uh, the picture that you're seeing right now um, is a, a, a couple that I met along with a few other people at a motel in, in Benton Harbor, Michigan. And that, that's a town um, that's about an hour east of Chicago. Um, and it's right, right off of the interstate. Um, and it's an extremely segregated town. It's sort of notorious for that. But in, um, you know, the, the motel itself attracted a lot of people who actually lived in the town. And these are people who are, we'll say that they're residentially challenged. 
you know, they had difficulty maybe putting up several hundred dollars a month for rent, but they could scrape together 50 bucks for a night in a hotel room. So they might prefer doing that for two or three nights than sleeping in their car or crashing at a friend's house or something like that. So I, uh, I just saw this place when I was driving down the highway and it was kind of dilapidated. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that, you know, as a, as a photographer, I'm sort of drawn to that because I think it speaks to something about the, uh, the Rust Belt in the United States and the, the, the sense that um, this part of the country um, has maybe not fared well in a lot of the economic changes. Uh, so, you know, there's, you know, economically and then culturally, you know, there's sort of also the shift towards each coast. And, um, you know, these are people who might feel like they're left behind in some way. And then you have the added element, which was quite strange of, this is a mixed race couple. So the woman is white, the man is black, and he has a Confederate flag hanging on the wall of the motel room, you know, for reasons that are sort of complicated. And I, you know, may not want to go, you know, he told me about it and I don't want to, you know, sort of tell his personal story about that, but it's, uh, he, he, he doesn't put it up there with any sense of irony. Um, so it's just one of those, you know, one of those scenes that to me, like when I was witnessing it, it seems ambiguous and difficult to understand for me. It's not like I have the answers and it's not like I'm trying to explain it in full. I'm just trying to show you something that the view, you being the viewer, uh, something that caught my eye. Now, when you were uh, covering campaign events or at the conventions or anything where there were supporters at ground level or on up, did you notice a difference between the way Hillary's supporters were reacting to her and the way Trump's supporters were sort of reflecting him? I, I <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think there was a difference. And one of the things I noticed is that um, the, the ideas and the tone, let's say, of a, of a Hillary Clinton event was almost predictable. So like, I don't, the, the way she interacted with the audience was, it was friendly and sometimes she spoke off the cuff, but um, you didn't get any, there, there almost wasn't really anything unexpected, you know, and because of her own personal and professional history, I think she's very careful about what she says all the time. She's used to that. Whereas with Trump, you know, he, it's almost like he doesn't care. So he's speaking much more off the cuff. And sometimes he had a teleprompter and he's reading from a script. Uh, and sometimes he, he could go on for five or 10 minutes where he's just speaking extemporaneously, just whatever it is uh, off the top of his head. Um, and so by doing that, I think that, um, you know, sometimes he would say something kind of outlandish um, but other times, it, you know, the, he could say something that would really uh, energize the crowd. So there was always that sense that there's an expectation that he might say something really wild. And that, and, and that kept the audience engaged. And what about when he talked about fake news and the uh, news media when you were there as a, as a press photographer? Yeah, so I mean, my experience was I was never in one of those situations where I was inside a pen, like a fence that had been created in the middle of the of the arena. I was always able, for the most part, I was always able to move around. So I never felt like uh, an animal in a zoo where people were yelling things or throwing things at me, <laughs> you know, the experience that I think other journalists had. But, you know, I did have a few quasi confrontations, never physically, but just, you know, verbally with with some people. Um, so, you know, that, that tone was, you know, it was really, it was really a drag and it's, uh, you know, those of us who work in that profession, you know, you, you can't help, but, uh, you know, um, but feel, um, you know, that he was sort of taking advantage of, of that, of finding some other kind of, you know, vehicle for his, for his anger or for people's anger, you know, right. So. And so you came to DC, you relocated basically, mm -hmm. uh, and you stayed for the entire administration. Was what you found actually being up close to Congress and DC in general, what you might've expected or was it very different? It was, um, it was even more formal in some ways than I, than I expected. I think, um, I mean, a lot of the reason that I moved there was really a sense of curiosity about what goes on in Congress and at, let's say one of these, a big hearing, what, what happens out of the frame of the TV camera? You know, I just wanted to know for myself because I'd never been in there 
And, uh, you know, I was very influenced by pictures from the 1960s and 70s um, that showed, you know, these like the water bait herrings and things like that. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's, there's a, a formality to this. There's a sense of protocol that seems very locked into place. You know, it's very, um, it's very predictable the way things play out in the halls of Congress and even during these hearings. So I think that was a little bit of a surprise. You know, just just absorbing this as a uh, just as a as a person where you're getting the news through television, through the media, whatever. You just have a sense of it was like it was just chaos all the time, which in some ways it was, but the chaos was sort of below the surface, and it's very hard to see that actually um, in a in any kind of a um, a visible way. You know, to, to you, you don't really experience that when you're in the Capitol. Or, or even in the White House, so. Yeah. Right, and you ended up shooting a lot of high profile uh, hearings, mm. including the one of the Robert, or the Robert Mueller hearing. Yeah, I think we've got a picture maybe from the, from the Mueller hearing. Um, um, and this, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was really kind of the main reason that I, that I moved to Washington was to be able to get access to hearings like that, you know, which reminded me of, you know, other political, you know, photography that I had, um, that I had absorbed when I was a teenager. So this is, um, you know, this is a House Intelligence Committee hearing. So this is on Capitol Hill. It's not in the Capitol. It's in one of the, the office buildings that's kind of adjacent to the Capitol. And this is right after Mueller first walked into the room. So you just see him surrounded by, you know, dozens of photographers, some TV people, and then people in the audience there. Um, so, it, you know, it's a, it's a really, really, highly charged moment. Right. Now, did you get the impression that some of the Washington DC photographers that we all know about, some of them have been there for decades. And was this period, did, did you know, did you feel like they were felt like this was a special period or was it just another day? No, I, th I think they definitely felt like it was a special period. I mean, the people who had worked in, in Washington for decades, even, um, for, sort of for two reasons. I think one is the dynamics that we just talked about, which is that there were so many of these highly charged hearings from Comey to Mueller impeachment hearings, uh, you know, like Ambassador uh, Yovanovitch, uh, you know, situations where um, the, the person who was speaking at the hearing, you really didn't know what they were going to say. And you didn't know if they sort of held some sort of a bombshell kind of information. So just from that standpoint, I think it was it was different. The amount of media, the amount of attention that were on all these events. And then the other part is that um, the way because Trump loves the media and he loves to be filmed and photographed and he loves to have, you know, to have his voice be on television. Um, um, he, he allowed more access in the White House than um, most other presidents do. So compared to Obama, you know, right before him, from what I heard, because I'd never, I'd never covered Obama, but um, compared to those days, my, uh, you know, the impression that, you know, what people told me about was that, you know, in those days, maybe let's say, you, if, you're, if you're a photographer in the White House, you might see the president a couple of times a week. You have to be there, you know, the media is there every day as part of the in-house White House pool, but there may be only a couple of events during the week where you go in, maybe it's an Oval Office thing with a dignitary, or maybe there's a photo op or a TV op in the, uh, in the cabinet room or something like that. But with Trump, it was almost every day he wanted to do something. And particularly like these scenes where um, he would come and go from the helicopter from Marine One, taking off from the South Lawn. That was open to all the press. Like there was no, uh, if you had a pass to get into the White House, there was no sort of pool restriction about doing that. You could just go. And he liked almost every time, particularly on a departure, he liked to stop and, and talk to the press. Hmm. Now, uh, I mean, th this scene with uh, Mueller is a very dramatic scene. But even this sort of pales to this other picture that you got during the Kavanaugh hearings uh, of uh, Senator Flake, uh, mm -hmm. sort of uh, dealing with other senators of his party uh, over uh, how he was responding. What, what, what can you say about that picture? Yeah, um, that, that was a very, um, 
that was a really unusual moment. And uh, I think we, we might have this picture. Um, I mean, I'll talk about it for a, a few minutes, so there's no, no rush to put it up. But, um, you know, if, if you all remember, you know, Brett Kavanaugh, a Trump nominated Brett Kavanaugh to be on the Supreme Court. And um, so that set up sort of what would be the normal round of confirmation hearings. So he spent a couple of days on Capitol Hill speaking, you know, in front of the Senate, uh, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee and did the same thing on the other side. Uh, actually, it was probably just the Senate side, but it's several days later, you know, these allegations about him um, possibly assaulting someone um, uh, came out. And so uh, this was uh, around that time. And it was, the, I think it was the same day that uh, Christine Blasey Ford, um, who was the accuser, testified before one of the committees. And then uh, Kavanaugh came back, or maybe it was the next day. And um, Jeff Flake, who was one of the Republicans um, on the committee, uh, took to heart these allegations. And he thought that they were serious enough that he, he thought there should be a process for investigating those before he, yeah, that's the picture there, before he um, sort of rubber stamped the nomination to send it to the big Senate, to the, to the Senate at large. So uh, that was a hearing that only lasted 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, you know, it was one of the really like, almost like the only hearing that I went to in those four years where people really didn't know what was gonna happen. And the key part of it is that Flake was really going against the members of his own party. So as soon as he sat down and he, he called, he was, the last, uh, he was the last Senator to come into the room. He sat down and, um, uh, you know, he, he called for this delay. He said he wasn't going to vote until there was a gave the FBI a week to, uh, to do the investigation. And I knew at that moment, this guy's the most important person in the room. So I placed myself right in front of his chair, just, just underneath, you know, just on the other side of the bench. So as soon as the gavel came down, I'm allowed to stand up. And so I was right in front of his chair uh, just at that moment when these other Republican senators, like Lindsey Graham, you see to the right, and the two people on the left there, they, you know, they immediately came around him. And Lindsey Graham sat down and he said, you know, we got to talk. You know, that's, and I actually talked to Jeff Flake a few weeks ago to ask him if I heard that correctly. And he, he told me that, yeah, that, that was right. That's exactly what Lindsey Graham said. So it was just a very unusual moment, you know, and it made for an unusual picture. Now, obviously, uh, part of what people responded to is, is the way this is composed, but it's really instant, right? I mean, it's not like they're standing there for 10 minutes waiting for you to find the right spot. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's an instant. It happened very quickly. You know, it was just a few seconds, really, where this, where the, it had that kind of organization of him being surrounded by those people. And so, yeah, it's fleeting. And, uh, you know, I was shooting maybe, maybe with my motor drive, I can't remember, but let's say two frames a second or something like that. And, uh, you know, every frame is different. You know, every frame looks noticeably different. So, yeah. And uh, when you're getting a shot like this, which again, people responded really strongly to, uh, do you feel it right away? Or is it only looking at it afterwards that you know you got something? Yeah, I, I felt like I, I, I had something pretty good. I mean, in my head, you know, the, what happened was is that, you know, the gavel came down maybe 30 seconds of taking a picture like this and then Flake stood up and he made his way out of the room. And that process took maybe another 30 seconds. So I kept photographing as that happened. So, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm, I, I'm not looking at the back of the camera as soon as I take that picture. You know, I still have, uh, I still have work to do. And, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to see it through to, to get every opportunity to photograph him as he's leaving the room. I was on assignment for Time Magazine uh, when I shot this. And so, you know, immediately after the hearing, I went into a workroom that we use and uh, I started processing my pictures and I had maybe a dozen from that afternoon that I was sending. And the photo editor, Andrew Katz, um, you know, messaged me back right away that he, he thought it was a really good picture. So, um, yeah, so I, I felt pretty good about what I had that day. Yeah. Right. So you have uh, 104 pictures in this book. Uh -huh. You must have thousands to choose from from this period. Uh, what were you, what was the process and, and how did you... You must have 
there must be some left on the table that are some pretty good pictures. Yeah, there are there are pictures left on the table, and that's that's one of the hardest things is that um, um, the the process basically worked like this. I mean, at, at the end of um, I, I had been kind of compiling in the last those four years um, what kind of my favorite pictures were all the time, so, you know, as, as the months went on. So towards the end of 2020, um, I had a folder of maybe or folders of maybe 700 pictures. You know, some of them were pretty similar, but, you know, about that many pictures and I, at that point, I mean, I sort of had an intention of at least trying to put together a book, but I didn't really have a sense of what the, the narrative was going to be exactly. Um, but I got in touch with um, a former uh, photo editor, uh, a great colleague of mine from U.S. News and World Report. Her name is Jen Poji, who's now an assistant professor at uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology. And Jen... Um, uh, you know, uh, offered to go through these hundreds of pictures. And this is what she does. I mean, she's, you know, there's no, no one more capable of doing something like that than her. And she has a great sense of, of being able to, to kind of see patterns emerge. And um, it's a, you know, I, no matter how good you feel about your photography, I mean, it's always useful to have someone that you like or respect or has sort of an idea what you're trying to do, uh, look at your work, because they, they're able to just see things from a different perspective. And, um, you know, we, we spent a few weeks going over these pictures and talking about what might be the, the narrative. And we really saw that it was very much of a chronological story. And by starting with those scenes in the Midwest, that we could kind of build, you know, what this, this arc of events was you know, moving from ordinary citizens into the halls of power, and then all these events in 2020. And, you know, we spent several weeks doing that. And then there was January 6th, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But, um, you know, at that point, it's sort of like this, this event, if you look at, at it as a four or five year event, you know, it became pretty clear what that was. So then you start to, then you have to distill and you have to look for the pictures that will explain that and it will show what you're trying to say. Um, and then I brought in, it's sort of at that point, like maybe once it was down to 200 or something like that, I brought in um, uh, uh, another great former colleague of mine, Olivier Picard, uh, who is also a photo editor at US News. And it was sort of the three of us doing that. But I also asked the opinion of friends, including you. You know, there were times when I thought I kind of liked the picture and maybe I'll show it to Jen or Olivier and they don't like it. So I'm sort of hoping for, well, maybe I'll get a third opinion. Maybe somebody will like it, you know? And then if that, there's some, maybe there's just something about that picture that I like, but everybody shoots it down. So I just have to accept that, that it's just not that good and or it doesn't fit or whatever. Um, so, you know, you do that and then it's just chipping away, chipping away until you have something that feels, you know, not too lean, but not excessive either. Uh, one picture that is probably was part of it since it happened uh, was, is this sort of, uh, sort of a landscape of January 6th with the Capitol in the background. And on the uh, one side of the frame is a Trump supporter. He's got Trump going across his forehead and he's gagging or coughing from uh, tear gas or whatever, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, I probably have that picture as well. Yeah. Um, that, you know, you've shot other protests, you've shot riots and other chaotic scenes. How do you, you know, obviously the, the part of the challenge is finding some, a moment of clarity that captures the, the moment of chaos. Yeah, exactly. And it was, as, it, it was as challenging in that situation as almost anything I've done just because of the number of people that were around me. You know, um, I mean, just the, the, um, the logistics of that situation is that this mob of thousands of people were basically storming up the steps and up, and up the scaffolding that had been erected for Biden's inauguration. So that scaffolding was kind of like on the sides. Um, and so it's almost like every available space was just packed with people. And, um, you know, that's, that's the challenge in something like that. And, you know, obviously I fell back on my experience of having, 
done other riots before and, and trying to make some order out of out of chaos. But you know, it, re it requires shooting a lot of frames. And um, I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of pictures I took that day, but the vast majority of them are completely uh, disorganized. And, and a lot of them, there's actually just, you can't even really tell what's going on because people are in front of the camera. They're blocking my view. There's hands, there's flags, there's heads, you know, taking up half the frame. So um, yeah, that was just one of those things where I framed it and then, you know, shot a sequence of pictures with the motor drive. And, uh, you know, that one ended up being reasonably well composed. And uh, so while you're photographing this, you also have to be concerned about people who don't like the media. Uh, there's a lot of them in that crowd. Uh, and just, you know, being safe because of all the people. So that, that must be an extra distraction, extra challenge. It, it, yeah, it is, it is an extra distraction, an extra challenge. I mean, in, in these kind of riots, I mean, the main, fortunately, I mean, there, where I was, there was no live gunfire, you know, and that's, that's always, the, you know, unless there's something worse than that, that's always the, the main thing you have to worry about. And there wasn't that. Uh, it was really, you know, the biggest danger was just getting hit by something flying, like a tear gas canister or something that somebody had been throwing or getting knocked down by the crowd or something like that. And, uh, but yeah, you know, there was this added element of some of those people really hating the media and being very suspicious of, you know, to them, it's like, they don't, I don't think they really have, most of them don't really have an idea of the independent media. It's either you're either with us or you're against us. So I was stopped a lot during that day as I had been at the previous two Trump rallies that happened in the few weeks leading up to January 6th. And, and rallies in Washington, D.C., where people asked me, you know, who I was taking pictures for. And so, you know, my was, response was always like, um, you know, I'm taking pictures for this photo agency called Redux. You probably never heard of it, but my pictures, you know, can go out, can be, can be anywhere. You know, I'm not working, for, most of the time I wasn't, you know, working for a single media organization. So my goal in those kind of interactions is just to get out of it as fast as possible. You know, and so I think I think the the Trump rally before I think I got some kind of a press pass that said you know March for Trump or something like that, and I had that on. I had my Capitol Hill press credential like inside my jacket, and I had the Trump pass on the outside. And so you know, if somebody stopped me, hey, what are you doing? I would just very quickly I sort of flash that quick answer and move on because you don't want to, you don't want to get slowed down and you don't want to get in a situation where other people start to see you interacting with somebody because then two or three people are going to come around and that's when it that's when it can get dangerous so let's move on is the idea right and so what, what did you begin your day thinking you were you were shooting a protest at the ellipse and whatever happened typical protest day or were you prepared for the worst? Um, I was, um, I was um, concerned about the worst, uh, but I didn't know what kind of form that would take. And um, I didn't, um, I mean, I didn't really make any predictions or have any expectations about how it might unfold exactly. Um, but I didn't expect this to happen. Um, that was one thing that I just, I just was, it was a complete shock. And um, uh, yeah, so I started out photographing the, the rally at the ellipse and I knew there was this sort of, there was an energy about it that felt uh, more intense than the previous two rallies. So I felt like something was gonna happen and I took the subway to the Capitol, you know, after about an hour, just to be there at the Capitol kind of waiting. And within, you know, 10 minutes of my arrival, it already, things were already kicking off. Um, yeah, so it was, yeah. Um, so in the book and, and just anyone who was paying attention to the news this, these last four years or five years, there's a lot of violence. Um, it wasn't just, you know, the usual headbutting pol politics. It was, there was actual violence. There was uh, violent protests. Uh, there was the rise of the Proud Boys and, um, you know, Oath Keepers. Um, how, how did that sort of affect the, the experience of shooting this 
this period? You know, it that was sort of the, I mean, I think that was the surprising part of it, um, uh, you know, uh, relative to what my expectations were before I went to Washington. You know, I really thought I'm just going to be photographing inside all the time and I'm going to be photographing politicians and that's going to be the story. And that's kind of how it was for about three years. And then everything played out on the streets when you had the George Floyd protests where you had, you know, hundreds or thousands of people like literally like pressing up very close to the gates of the White House. And then you had the Trump rallies, you know, you had, I mean, Washington DC is one of the most democratic cities. But by that, I mean the political party uh, uh, based on population in the United States. And so you had these people that had completely the opposite view of that, their own political orientation. Suddenly thousands of them flooding into the heart of Washington, DC. So that changed the feeling in town and it made everything very uh, visceral. And you had a, just the, the feeling of violence and conflict, even if you didn't actually see it played out. I see. Now there, uh, you just mentioned the uh, protests pressing up against the White House. There's this one picture you have, uh, uh, I guess it's a Black Lives Matter protester. He's, he's, he's not doing it. He's just staring at the this line of police mm -hmm. plastic shields and the White House is in the background. I mean, it really captures a feeling and an atmosphere. How would you sort of describe what was going on? That was a very um, that was a very visceral moment, and sometimes protests um, can have a um, a little bit of a predictable quality to them, or, or or there's a little bit of a sense of theater. That wasn't the case when I took this picture. This was either, I mean, it was one or two nights after the initial protest in Minnesota uh, about the George Floyd murder. So this was, uh, I, I mean, I forget the exact date of of his death, but this was just a couple of days later. And so um, this is right up against Pennsylvania Avenue. And so on the other side of the street is Gates, you know, is a, is a big fence and that's where the White House grounds start. And so, uh, yeah, there was nothing, um, there was nothing canned or predictable about this. It was just, it just felt like real, true emotion kind of getting played out um, right there in front of the White House, which to me was just, uh, you know, it doesn't get any more poignant than that, really, um, where you have just an ordinary person uh, uh, who feels compelled to go back there and sort of have this standoff with the police. And those are uniformed uh, Secret Service uh, officers um, in that photo. Oh, I and, see. And, and a, right, it's not DC police. It's not park police. I mean, I think we, we might be standing right, right at the edge of uh, Lafayette Square Park which is sort of, um, it's on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House. So yeah, it's, you know, it, it's right there. And um, the Secret Service is sort of in control of, the, of that area. And within a day or two, they had erected fences um, around the park so that the park itself became a buffer zone between the White House and the protesters. So this kind of proximity only happened in the first uh, day or two, yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the technique getting a picture like that? A lot of people would use a big flash at that moment, and it would look a lot different. It would capture some. It would it, the emotion would be different. Uh, just the feeling of it would just be different. Can you kind of talk about what you're sort of going for and and how you go about it. Yeah, you know, there's. Um, I mean, I've I've mostly used available light. Um, in my work. And so I, that's tends to be my default because I just, I, I'm more interested in capturing the atmosphere of like how it just feels to me um, and how it would look to somebody who was there. So I think of, in some ways, I think of my uh, role as, as an observer for just somebody who can't be there. So I, I, I don't shoot with terribly wide lenses and I don't like to use telephotos if I don't have to, just using very normal um, you know, focal length, 35 to 50 sort of range most of the time. So it's as if you were standing right there. So to me, the atmosphere of that night, you know, is just pouring down rain and you have this, you know, the, the floodlights that had been set up by the Secret Service, you know, kind of backlighting and illuminating the shields of the police, you know, with those raindrops. And that just, you know, it would have looked really different with flash and it could have been great, but, um, but that's, you know, this picture with that kind of light more conveys the feeling of what I had 
when I was there. And that's usually what I'm going for. Uh, another, another big thing, obviously, in the book and over the last couple of years was the arrival of COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of pictures of people wearing masks at, at a certain point in the book. Yeah. And clearly it added a whole other element to just being in DC. Mm. It was uh, an intense political subject, but also there's fear. There's a picture of, uh, of a reporter, I guess. He's completely, he's wearing gloves, mat, you know, face mm. shield. He's got a hand sanitizer on his belt. He's totally protected and worried. So what did that sort of bring to the story? Yeah, you know, that, that was another example um, of something that was happening in the country. And in this case, of course, around the world, actually being visible in the halls of power. Because you usually don't see that connection, literally, right? You know, it's just people talking about stuff. But here was it a case where you actually saw it play out. So this was uh, in one of the office buildings on Capitol Hill, and it was before a press conference, I think. And it was in the early days of COVID, you know. So yeah, people were being extremely careful. And it, that also, I mean, it, um, you know, uh, the arrival of COVID changed the press access to a lot of these events. And so a lot of things that I was able to go to uh, up until COVID hit um, were then off limits to me because the way things were structured, they just wanted to have a much uh, smaller, um, group of reporters and things became pooled so that, you know, that organizations were sharing their photos instead of each, you know, a single person from each organization being able to be there. So I had to cut back going to the Capitol and going to the White House uh, during that year. Uh, and yet there's a picture in the book, and I think we have it, of uh, Nancy Pelosi walking, is it in the rotunda? In the rotunda, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Where... Um, there's distance around her, but mm -hmm. she's guarded, and mm -hmm. there's another photographer who splashes going off mm -hmm. at the moment he was shooting. And that sort of also captures. Yeah, yeah. That photographer, by the way, is Louis Palou, great photographer who's still in Washington doing, you know, doing amazing stuff. Um, and he's shooting in on film in black and white. He's in the very left part of the frame. Uh, but yeah, and you see Manu Raju from CNN on the right side of the frame, and the other people are are, are Pelosi staffers and maybe a security person there towards the right. So yeah, it was just one of those really odd scenes that I think, um, you know, this was a, you know, a few months after people were doing this during COVID. So you're sort of a little bit used to seeing it, but you know, 20 or 30 years from now, it's gonna look pretty odd. And, uh, you know, in a way that's kind of my intention with, uh, with making a, a photograph like that. Right, so, uh, you know, you know, we've talked a lot about Trump already, but there was a lot of other people who became regular figures in the media and you know, or in your book, people, characters that maybe we didn't know about before or didn't know enough about. You know, you have Roger Stone, you have, uh, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg is a well-known person, but, you know, the people that pop up uh, in your book, I mean, did you find... Uh, Anything interesting about these this particular crowd of people that was around? Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely a, a, a strange, you know, um, set of people that were kind of, you know, either directly related or, you know, and a lot of it, you know, it's usually it's usually other politicians or people who are sort of part of the Washington circle that become important. You know, I mean, during Watergate, maybe it's. You know, it's G. Gordon Liddy who worked directly, you know, for Nixon, or it's H.R. Uh, it's, uh, Haldeman, or, you know, people who are kind of already in the inner circle. But in this case, you know, you just had, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, who, you know, is not really in politics at all, or, you know, supposedly, but yet he ends up having, and his company ends up having a very big impact on how uh, events in Washington were happening. Um, so uh, you decided to leave. Uh, had you planned on leaving prior to the end of the Trump administration or? Um, yeah, my intention all along was, was uh, sort of treating the move to Washington, D.C. almost like a foreign posting. So I planned to stay for as long as Trump was president and that's it. And I actually didn't expect that he was going to last all four years. I thought he would flame out, something would happen. He'd resign or there was some impeachment that might happen after a couple of years. So that, you know, that became three. And then 2020, of course, was so dynamic. And so I was very happy to have been in Washington during that year. 
Um, and then everything, of course, ended on the 6th and with Biden. And at that point, I just couldn't wait to get out of town, actually, and come back to Los Angeles, where we are right now. So. Right. I mean, basically, through your whole career, you shot politics now and then. Uh, but this was the most intense time. Did you kind of get your fill of, of the subject, or do you think you'll go back to it? For now. I mean, I might go back to it at some point. But, um, you know, it's a very heavy thing to, to experience firsthand, um, you know, year after year. And, um, yeah, there's only, you know, there's only so much of that I can take before it gets a little too, a little too overwhelming. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing other things in the next year or two. I mean, did it give you a different perspective on, on some of the, you know, some of the photographers we've all heard of who, you know, like... Uh, you know, you know, you, uh, you could name some. Yeah, Doug Mills or. Yeah, I mean, people who, that's, that's their, their main thing. Right. Does it right. give you a different perspective on, on what they do and, and their work? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I really appreciate the kind of dedication they have to that subject and their ability to kind of keep doing these sometimes repetitive events over and over again, but looking for a little bit of nuance, something different each time. And that just requires a tremendous amount of patience and, and interest in that one style of photography, which is very, you know, it's very controlled and you're often working in a group of other photographers. And I think people who are used to that and who want to work that way, um, you know, a, a few of them are great at it and they can stick it out. Um, I'm not somebody that wants to work that way like all the time right and so now this book is done and you have a couple of shows happening mm -hmm. you talk right. a little bit about yeah that. sure so um so jen poji uh the uh, the photo editor i mentioned initially she's at rit and she's the uh, she's curated up uh, what i think is going to be a really terrific uh, exhibition um, at a city arts space in rochester new york that's going to open on february the 4th that's a friday evening and it's, you know, that the idea of that exposition, it's going to be a very immersive experience. It's not going to try to replicate what's in the book, but it's, you know, we're going to have a few really big prints. And um, I, you know, I just, I just want people to have like a visual experience that's radically different uh, uh, than anything they've had uh, with this subject, which most people have just seen on television and, you know, on their computer screens. So the book is one step of that goal. And then having that exhibition is another one. And then there's sort of a companion uh, exhibit that's gonna be a little bit more traditional that's gonna open um, uh, at the end of this month um, at the UC Berkeley School of Journalism. And Ken Light is uh, putting that one together. Would you mind holding up the book, David? Yeah, so yeah, so this is, this is the book. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the, the publisher is Punctum Press in Rome. And, you know, I, I really um, was very happy to have an Italian publisher because they, they make the best books and they really understand printing. The kind of paper we used for this is a, uh, it's sort of like a proprietary Italian paper. It's very heavyweight. It's not too glossy. You know, so the idea of the book is an, it's an experience, again, that, you know, a way for people to look at this whole narrative um, in, a, in a visual way that's very different from the way they've been absorbing these pictures for the last few years. Not just my pictures, but, you know, everybody's pictures. Um, so I think, are yeah. we, I yeah, I think we're done. It's I, about so, an hour. So. Yeah, so we're open to if there are any questions or anything else uh, that you guys want to talk about. Absolutely. We have a ton of questions. I don't know how many we'll get to. Um, I wanted to mention that there is an exhibit here in the gallery in Santa Fe and online at monroegallery.com of David's work. You can see it in back of us now. And we'd love to have you personally or virtually. And well, I, I go ahead, sorry. sorry, no, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I, I had hoped months ago, once we started, you know, working together that I was going to be able to meet you all in person and come to the gallery and do some kind of an event. Um, and that's just because of COVID and so many other situations, it's been difficult, but I know I'll get there in person um, sometime, sometime this year. Yeah, we look forward to it. I just wa wanted to also point out, um, and maybe this is, uh, we had a couple of questions about this also, but the book actually goes through January 6th and then you stayed for the inauguration. Um, and 
uh, just the question sort of were, what was it like after all of that chaos to then actually, you know, witness an inauguration unlike any other, um, but to actually see that happen? Yeah, you know, it was, um, I'd been to one other inauguration before, which was Obama's in 2008, and I wasn't at the Capitol. I was way down on the lawn, just like an ordinary person. Uh, so the first time I had, you know, this was the first time that I'd actually been at the Capitol for that. So I don't have anything to compare it to, but I mean, I, I can tell you for sure that it was different um, than it usually is. I mean, for one, because of, of COVID, so the amount of you know, people guests was was much um, was much less than it normally would be, and then also just the whole feeling, the fact that the Capitol grounds for you know there was miles of fences, topped with razor wire that had been erected all around the Capitol grounds. You know, in the days after January sixth, in anticipation of the inauguration, and. Um, you know, it was just a, it was, I mean, the word surreal is overused, but I'm just, it's the only word I can think of right now. It was just a very strange, almost spooky experience of, uh, of being inside this, you know, highly protected place. Um, even the National Guard, most of them were outside the fence that day, and people weren't really allowed to get even close to the Capitol that day. Uh, so it was very disturbing, and it was just something that, you know, I certainly never expected to see myself in, in my own country. Yeah. Um, here's a question. Um, it's really a question about your quote. Um, While I expected the incompetence, I underestimated the treachery. Can you be a little bit precise about that quote? <laughs> sure, I'll try. So, um, I mean, Trump was somebody who had no experience in government. None of the people around him were, were particularly experienced in government. And so this guy is going to be the president of the United States. And he didn't even seem to have not only the experience, but even an interest in uh, public policy or much a sense of the nuance of international affairs. That just wasn't in his background. Whatever, whether you like him or you don't like him, you know, you can't really argue that fact. Um, and then there was, I mean, the more information that was kind of came out about what kind, what his company or companies were like, you know, it was sort of, it was kind of chaotic. And, um, you know, this is before he became president. And so, um, uh, you know, this was a guy who'd, uh, you know, who, who, who had casinos in Atlantic City that went bankrupt. You know, so, you know, you don't, I, that didn't instill much confidence of him being the leader of the free world. And no. so I went into it thinking that, you know, a smooth transition into a well-oiled political machine or, you know, a functioning government was, uh, was likely to happen. I didn't think that it was. But what surprised me was the degree of... Um, yeah, I mean, I use the word treachery, and that's that's what I mean. If you look it up, I mean, it's uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, he and his inner circle having their own personal motivations to stay in power that were at odds with the way the United States is supposed to function. You want to take this one? Um, now that now that. Uh, you're a year removed and you've kind of had a little time to decompress. Is there anything that you would have done differently or anything that you missed that you would have, have liked to have photographed during that time? Yes. I mean, I, I, um, I mean, there's always, um, there's always, a you know, the thinking about how I could have done something differently or, or taken maybe another photographic approach. Um, one of the, I mean, one of the things about this is that as I explained to Steve earlier, like when I first started taking these pictures, I didn't think they were gonna end up in a book. And I mean, it was years before we even had a sense of what kind of the, the flow of these events would be. And it really wasn't until January 6th that that, you know, the sense of treachery you know, became obvious and visceral. Um, so there's there's that, but there are some things that I wish I would have gotten. I mean, I think the, um, you know, probably the most notable example is uh, the, um, 
the neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville. I forget what year that was, 2018, or maybe it was 2019, you know, where people were, you know, they were burning crosses, they were wearing swastikas. I mean, this was, um, you know, I, I didn't know about it in time to, to be there for that. And that, that's an important component to this. And I, and I, I just don't have it. So, yeah, and there are problems like that. Um, part of this question too is, do you have, is it possible um, to choose your most salient memory um, from chronicling that time? I think the most salient memory was, um, and I, I keep going back to January 6th, but it, it, it was that. And uh, I mean, there were a lot of very um, memorable moments during some of those hearings on Capitol Hill. Um, just some of the scenes at the White House. I mean, I remember particularly like the, um, I was at the White House on the Sunday that uh, William Barr, who was then the AG, released kind of a summary of the Mueller investigation. And it, you know, that summary, which we now know was, was a bit um, sort of slanted, um, that summary basically exonerated um, Trump of any gross misdeeds. So Trump was away. He was, I think he was in Florida during the day. And then I went to the White House to photograph him on the South Lawn when the helicopter landed. And, you know, at the White House, there's all the, there's all the sort of machinery around it. You know, the, the people, the Secret Service, the way everything operates. That's very orderly, it's organized. And it's, um, you know, when you just see it in the generic sense, you're sort of proud of it because it, it works. Um, but then seeing that helicopter land and seeing him get out after what, you know, after what seemed to me to be, it was sort of a letdown in some ways because I expected, I expected the, uh, the report to be much more critical of him. So that was sort of a notable moment. But, you know, the most visceral one without a doubt was when I was standing on the west steps of the Capitol, you know, about 2.30 in the afternoon on January 6th. And I was watching, you know, this mob of people. I just described it to somebody who interviewed me a, a few days ago. It's like a colony of ants. I wasn't even aware of a single individual. It was just this, just a single organism of, of, of energy just moving up the stairs. And there was one point where I actually just like put my camera down and I had my gas mask on and I'm just taking in this scene and I'm just trying to process it. And it was, uh, you know, I knew I was seeing something historical. It was very disturbing. And I just, I couldn't even believe it. So you brought a gas mask because of other protests that you had covered? Yeah, I mean, I started wearing gas masks pretty frequently when I was in Hong Kong in 2019 covering those protests. So by the time 2020 rolled around and the BLM protests where there was a lot of gas masks, I was sort of used to wearing it. So I wore it, you know, um, most of the time during those, you know, certainly on the 6th and then, and then sometimes during the Trump rallies uh, mm. prior to or, or at least I had it with me, you know. I, I think your um, description of that visceral moment on January 6th, and, and since you have a book right there, could you just show that picture of the scuffle on the steps with the American flag and law enforcement? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if we have it as a slide, but... I think we, we might. So, you know, this is, this is one of the pictures that I thought in the book that it was important to just make it as big as possible you know, which, which meant doing, you know, what we call a, a double truck or a double page spread here. So yeah, you can see these are the Trump supporters here. They're using this flag more or less as a weapon against uh, this is Metropolitan uh, DC police who are trying to hold the line. And, um, you know, it's not like I had in my head that I was going to take a picture like this. I'm just trying to make an orderly composition or, and just find a clear view of what's happening right in front of me. And that's what happened in that moment. And you can see like there's a, uh, you know, there's a metal kind of barricade that's been knocked over. Uh, you know, there's people tumbling down the stairs, you know, it's, it's just, it was just chaos. Yeah. Um, thank you. I just thought that was so um, relevant to that sort of taking a moment and just can't believe what you're seeing. And that sums it up. I think, um, we're, we're just past an hour, and I think that we'll wrap it up here. Um, we'd like to thank everybody who has joined us tonight. Um, you can contact us um, for David's book, um, and uh, also see prints that are available. And um, we'd like to thank Steve 
for taking the time to talk with David. And of course, a big thank you to David uh, for this evening, but also for recording this history, um, which I think, you know, we when we go back and even look through the book, we can't believe we all lived through it the last several years. So it's it's highly, highly significant. Yes, well, I mean, thank you every, everyone who joined in um, this afternoon. Thank you so much for your interest and, um, and Sid and Michelle, I, I so much appreciate your support, not just of this body of work, but everything you do uh, for the photojournalism community and uh, the work that you put in to kind of preserve this visual history, you know, not just work that's being made today, but work that goes back decades. That's really important and, and that needs to be seen in different venues and in different contexts. And um, that, that means a lot to us. Um, and those of us who, who do this. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody. We'll thank see, you very much. We'll see each other again. <laughs> okay. Good night, Chris. Good night.